Welcome to Questions with L.A. I am L.A. Marzulli, your intrepid host of the show, and we'll get into that in just a second. Folks, I got a stack of questions here, and we'll be getting into them in just a minute. But first, a word from our trusted sponsor, BioTrust. Folks, if you started to notice an increase in the appearance of wrinkles, fine lines, bags under your eyes, or other usual signs of aging, it might be more than just stress from the new year. Your collagen levels could be low. As you've gotten older, you may also found that your nails are more brittle. Hair is thinner and skin isn't as strong, which can be related to declining collagen production. Folks, this stuff works, and I want you to try it as well and experience the amazing effects it's had on me. Get a bag today for 51% off, plus receive several free bonuses before their New Year sale ends by going to healthwithla.com. That's healthwithla.com, and get ready to look your best in 2023. All right, so here we go. Uh, this is from uh samus samus i'm not sure how to pronounce that so please forgive me la thank you for all that you do you're a true christian leader stop right there anything i may or may not be all glory to the king i know who i am <laughs> and uh i know where i come from so all of it's him anything that i am is because of what he's allowed me to do and the gifting that he's given me but let's move on curious if you come across uh, gary wayne's 2014 book the Genesis 6 Conspiracy. Yes, I have read it. Uh, we've interviewed Gary Wayne. He's in our On the Trail of a Nephilim series. Um, if not, if you've not read the book, I, um, I've not read the book, but I just came across him recently in a podcast interview and found him well-researched, well-spoken, and fascinating. I'm curious of what your opinion might be. Thank you. Have a great day. Yeah, we, um, we interviewed uh, Gary Wayne, I think, in Mysterious Mound Builders, if I'm not mistaken, but I've also used him in other clips from that interview and other, uh, other uh, Armored Trail of the Nephilim series. Great guy, well-researched, soft-spoken, uh, and I consider him a friend. So, moving right along, this is for Martin. Question one, in Genesis 6-4, it tells us the Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterwards. A scripture you're well known for. Is it possible that the author was referring to the days of Jared, i.e. there were Nephilim on the earth during the days of Jared and also after his death? Let's stop right there. Moses is writing this thousands of years after the event, right? So, Mo, you know, the flood is here. Moses is writing thousands of years after the flood, okay? So he says the Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterwards. Why wouldn't he just say, well, the Nephilim were on the earth in those days, the days of Noah? And that was it. They all just went away. That's not what we have. So then Martin says, question two, uh, I read, so let, let, me, let me back up. If that's true, and Moses is writing from this perspective, that the Nephilim were in those days, the days of Jared, and also afterwards means exactly what that is. I actually wrote about this in the book, um, Counter Move, How the Nephilim Returned After the Flood. Martin, uh, if you can't afford it, I'll send it to you free. Shoot me an address. And, and I'll send it to you. But the answers that you're looking for, you know, the book is almost 300 pages. So I don't have time to read all 300 pages. But the bottom line is this. It was the same suicide event that happened before the flood. The fallen angels have one shot. That's to destroy the genome. And if we don't believe that, that's fine. Believe what you want to believe. But when we read Genesis 3.15, we know that that seed war erupts. In fact, I had a good friend of mine who sent me an email with a YouTube link. I didn't even look at the YouTube link because I've seen most of them. I'm completely aware of all the positions that people take regarding the Nephilim and these are the sons of Seth and all this other stuff. If it's the sons of Seth, why doesn't it just say, the, you know, the sons of Seth from the ungodly line of Cain? It never says that. That's twisted theology that happens far after the event. The rabbis all know uh, who the sons of God were. They know the Genesis 6 narrative. They know about the Nephilim. Jesus, when he's incarnated on the planet, he figures that everybody knows exactly what he's talking about. So he says something very cryptic. It'll be like the days of Noah at the coming of the Son of Man. What differentiates those days? It's a seed war, Genesis 3.15. So question two, I've read five possibilities for how the Nephilim survived after the flood. One, they went underground, not buying that. Two, they went off grid in the air. That's a possibility. Three, they were amphibious. Don't believe that for a second. 
Their DNA was in the wives of Noah's sons. I address this. That's, in my opinion, that's just ridiculous. So God destroys everything, but he allows uh, one of the wives, specifically of Ham, to come on the, uh, on the ark, and she's carrying a Nephilim gene. Not buying it for a minute. Not buying it. Five, there was a second incursion of fallen angels. That's what it was. It's a second incursion and a third incursion and a fourth incursion. And it continues until the cross. And then it changes. And this is where we get into what my wheelhouse is. Daniel chapter 2. Their seed will mingle with the seed of men, but they will not cleave to them. So what does that mean? What does that mean? Genesis 2. Well, I don't know, L.A. Who are they in that chapter? Just think about that. Who are they in that chapter? It's not men mingling their seed with the seed of men. It's an outside agency. And the writer, seal up the words to the book. The angel saying to Daniel, Daniel, seal up the words of this book. Because you won't know this till the time of the end. Here we are. I talk about this in our, in our new film on abductions. This is the kicker. They are mingling with their seed, but there's no marriage contract. Where did I learn that from? Jim Williamson taught that in his book, Beyond Science Fiction. They're mingling the seed. Chuck Missler talked about it. They're mingling the seed. Who are they? The fallen angels. So it's the same thing. They're mingling their seed with the seed of men, but they will not cleave to them. It's right there. The problem is in the churches, there's this truncated view of the supernatural. And so the Genesis 6 narrative is never taught. Moreover, the Genesis 3.15 narrative is never really expounded on. Genesis 3.15, that little vignette where Jesus, pre-incarnate Jesus, is in the garden. Adam and Eve over here, they've just sided with the dragon. There's the dragon. And Jesus said, your seed, your offspring. Read different translations if you don't believe me. Read, read 10 or 15 different translations of Genesis 3.15. Your seed, your offspring, will be at war and enmity with the seed, with the offspring of the woman. The proto-evangelium, the one coming from the seed of the woman, will crush the dragon's head. It sets up the rest of the biblical narrative. If we don't understand Genesis 3.15, then when we get to Genesis 6, then we're clueless. Uh, this is from Ellen. Have you come across or seen this so-called document? What do you think? Oppenheimer, Einstein, it's it's a Biblio Tecopleides, right? Um, relationship with inhabitants of celestial bodies. And I, I have looked at it. I know what they are saying. It says the presence of unidentified spacecraft is accepted as de facto by the military. And this is dated June 1947. Look, the military knows exactly what's going on. If you watch our UFO uh, weekly update yesterday, I talked about that. That new agency that they have, Arrow, now is, well, we haven't made contact with aliens. Well, why, why should we believe anything you say? Until you clear up Roswell and what really happened, until the government actually admits that there was a crash disk in Roswell. How do I know that? I have two witnesses. I have two witnesses. Witness one was Jesse Marcel Jr. His father was the uh, intelligence officer of the 509th Bombing Group stationed in Roswell, New Mexico in 1947. To think that Marcel Sr. wouldn't know <laughs> what a weather balloon looks like are you kidding me? It's an insult to the man's intelligence. These were not weather balloons that crashed in the desert. Not for an instant. Marcel Sr. brought the wreckage home. You heard me talk about this ad nauseum. Set it on the table, woke his beautiful wife up. His son told him to look at it, handle it, and said, what you're seeing now, you may never see again. This is from a craft from another world. That's witness number one. Witness number two is Colonel Hill. Deathbed confession. He was flown to Roswell hours after the crash. He was an intelligence officer for the OSS, an interrogator. OSS is the forerunner of the CIA. He sat there and tried to communicate with the alien who was alive. Now, that alien, in my opinion, the gray, is a biological construct. It's an avatar for a demon to inhabit. That's why they can crash these things. They don't, they just... And, and look, how do I know this? I've heard it from experiencers, people who were taken on board the ship numerous times. And, and Whitley Strieber talks about it, seeing the shells of these entities laying in the ship. Let's move on. So I hope that answers your question. Um, this is from Edwin. What if Og was the last of the giants, the human giants? Well, you know, 
people have such a hard time with this, which is why we keep getting emails from people, as you can see. A good friend of mine emailed me this morning and talked about and asked me the question. As I said just a few minutes ago, you know, what, how is all this possible? How, how are angels procreating with the women of earth and all this other stuff? If we don't get Genesis 3.15, we never get any of this. Og is not the last of the giants. He's the last of the Raphaim. But who's, who's, why are the Nephilim tribes in the Levant to begin with? Why does that mandate come down from a loving, holy God to Joshua and Caleb? Go in to the promised land, wipe everybody out. The Nephilim, the Raphaim, the Anakim, the Zanzumim, the Emims. Josephus talks about it, that the Nephilim were there in the promised land. And the forefathers that conquered the land kept the bones. And those bones are openly on display in Jerusalem at the time of the writing in the first century. So I've written about this in the Cosmic Chess Match. I've also really elaborated on in the newest book, my last book, number 13 in, in the series of, of tomes that I've been writing, uh, basically counter move, how the Nephilim returned after the flood. This is from Ellen. In my news I receive, uh, in my inbox I receive, this is a trailer. Aliens are just extra uh, temporal, which would mean they're outside of time. Yes, I've seen this in plain sight. I've watched the movie. Um, it's just amazing how all points of view, except the Christian point of view, can get on Netflix and everything else. We're trying to get our new film on Netflix. So far, it's not going anywhere. So if that's the case, I'm giving these guys, the showrunners, until the end of the month to fish or cut bait. Then it goes up on our streaming site so people can download it from all over the world and watch it. It's that important. Look, these are not extraterrestrials. They are not time travelers. They are, in fact, the fallen entities. This is the coming great deception. You've heard me talk about this. If you're new here, this is what the coming great deception is. Second Thessalonians, book found in our Bibles, the guidebook of a supernatural, states unequivocally that there will be an apostasia, a great falling away, a falling away from the faith. How does that happen? You tell me. What event could cause millions of people to change their paradigm? Read Second Thessalonians and you tell me. I have, I've written numerous books on this subject, produce videos on it, been on countless shows. Uh, by the way, I will be uh, down in uh, Texas. Go on our website, lamarzuli.net. You can check it out for yourself. But I will be in Texas next week. Looking forward to meeting people. And uh, if you're near, if you're near that, uh, that site, uh, check it out on the website, lamarzuli.net. I hope to see you there. It's, it's going to be a hoot. I'm uh, speaking on Friday night and then twice on Saturday. We'll also have a Q&A. Uh, L.A., this is from Sharp. Um, there are some ancient art. There seems to be some ancient art that showed people in machines, watches, laptops, other modern, other modern things. Um, yeah, I've, I've seen these things. Um, and if you'll notice in a lot of the ancient art, you'll see these, these uh, they call them the Anunnaki, with these little bags in their hand, what's that about? No one really knows. It's all speculation. But many of these entities holding these little bags in their hand. Hmm. There is technology up there. And of course, we'll get into that in just a little bit. But I get that. Like in the hieroglyphics, you'll see what looks like a helicopter. Um, there are, and, and ancient aliens have talked about this. There are what appear to be airplanes. Um, found in, in tombs and things like that, models of airplanes, and they would fly if you built one out. So what are we looking at? Well, we know this, that the good guys can traverse through time. Good angels have the ability to go and see the future, obviously only if the Lord allows them to see that. Father God sees, and this is the cornfield analogy, human beings see what we see in a cornfield. The corn is eight feet high, all right? We're in a cornfield. I look around. I see the corn in front of me, the corn to my left and, my, and to my right. That's it. A little bit behind me. In other words, we are stuck in the three-dimensional space-time continuum. We see what's in front of us. We can't go into the future. However, the fallen one, the dragon, shows up in that same cornfield, and guess what? He's got a, uh, a hook and ladder on a fire truck, and he climbs up that ladder. He can see the entire field of corn and also some fields in front of it. So he's got vision. He can see a little bit into the future. He's not all-knowing. 
Then we got the Most High God in the space shuttle, who's examining every. He can see the dime that just dropped out of my out of my pocket as I'm standing in that cornfield. But then he zooms back. Not only does he see the entire cornfield, he sees the entire state of Kansas. He knows all and he sees all. The only person who can do that is the Most High God, El Shaddai. Hope that answers your question, Chark. Thanks for writing in. This is from Tanya. I so appreciate your openness and uh, wanting to engage with your supporters. Well, thank you, Tanya. That's very kind of you to say that. It's very unique for someone of your position to want to hear from us. Um, never forget where we come from and who we really are. Sinners saved by grace, bound up in the new age, believing in Eastern mysticism and the occult. And then I got saved and the light bulb went on. That's 43 years ago. And once again, thank you, Tanya, and thank you, Sean, for your kind words. Um, I have had uh, questions for many years in researching the end of the book of Revelation. So there are seven seals, seven trumpets, seven bulls, and seven thunders. What do you think the seven thunders are and why the Lord didn't want them exposed? Um, they are, and, and she continues, I have my own theory, one I have thought on after learning your work, Steve Quayle, Tom Horn, Tim Almarino. Could it be related to the alien phenomena or on my way off? You know, Tanya and, and Sean, I don't really know um, what the seven thunders are. Some things are sealed up. Some things are just not permitted. He doesn't let them out. You know, seal up the words of this book, Daniel, until the time of the end. Remember when two over the face of the earth, knowledge will increase. That's the angel telling Daniel, seal up the words. No one will really understand this until the time of the end. We're in the time of the end. Their seed will mingle with the seed of men, but I digress. So the bottom line is, God just goes, nope, you've seen it, but you're not gonna, you're not gonna report on that. I'm holding those back. There's a reason for that. I don't know what that is. I can speculate. Could it be the alien phenomena? Could be. Bully for you for thinking that. Uh, this is from Jethro Hale. What are, you, what are your views on a 1994 Zimbabwe UFO school encounter? Why are these entities so fascinated with children? Well, they're fascinated with children because they can manipulate them very easily. When, it, when If you watch our n number four in the film on abductions, um, Karen, Alan, and Emil were all taken very young when they were children. Children really can't fight back. They can be, they can be manipulated very easily. They can be coerced. They can be um, made incredibly fearful, like Karen was. You know, we'll behead your entire family uh, unless you do what we tell you to do. Stop talking about the abductions. They're also after fresh genome. They will follow a child until that child comes into puberty. And then they take sperm from the men, over from the women. The women find themselves impregnated. Watch our film. It's my moment. There's no other film like it that I'm aware of, either in the secular world or in the Christian world. So, you know, we're, we're covering it, and I'm working on number five on crop circles and hope to have that out maybe by the end of the month, certainly early February. Oh, this is from Laura, L.A. Do you believe there are Nephilim leftovers? The one man who was on with his wife have uh, interactions, and I think they are good. What are your thoughts? So thank you for all you continue to do and enlightening us exponentially. Well, I appreciate that, Laura. Thank you for the kind words. Is Sasquatch a Nephilim? Very possible. That, that's what I'm going to. Scott Carpenter, who I had a conversation with several weeks ago, believes that that's exactly what these entities are. Um, my judgment, honestly, is still up, but I'm very, very cautious. Now, the two people that we had on the show, uh, Kat and Wayne, basically they're saying that they interact with these creatures all the time. There are good ones and there are bad ones. Wayne calls them the keeper of the forest. I don't know. Talk to Scott Carpenter. He has a completely different viewpoint. Talk to David Pilates. He has a completely different viewpoint. Anyway, let's continue. Um, this is from Jeff Jessica. Hey, L.A., I want to start by expressing my deepest thanks and gratitude for all you and your family do each day. Thank you. I really appreciate that, Jessica. The efforts of your ministry has changed my life and the life of my family I've shared your work with. I am beyond grateful and eternally blessed because of your faithfulness to God's call and mission on your life. You know, it's, it's, it's letters like this that just blow me away. And once again, glory to the king. Um, he's given me the platform to do this. He's given me the insight and the training, the back training. I was immersed in the, U, in the new age, which enabled me to see the contrast between occult thinking, new age thinking, and biblical Christianity. So I, I've been on both sides of the aisle. And I enjoy, in some ways, a very unique perspective because of that. You and your wife are extremely brave and strong. I am moved when I think of all you endured and faced spiritually and physically in this realm. My little two-year-old daughter knows that mommy listens to L.A. and she knows your voice. Well, that's, 
That's very kind of you to say. She wants to see you talk when I play the videos. I will be teaching her as soon as she grows, and your work has been so vital in these last days. I also want to mention hearing you speak about your little granddaughter, Opal, and let you know that I chose the name Opal for my six-month-old daughter's middle name. Well, thank you. I really appreciate that. Uh, Opal was um, Carrie Opal Rudisell, which was my wife's mother's middle name, so we've carried that tradition on. Okay, it also happens to be my favorite stone. The question to you came to me as I was walking my little girls outside today. I was feeling pretty down, and by the grace of the Lord, the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart and brought to mind the info I've learned about the ancient libation rituals given to deceased relatives. And this is, of course, is Derek and Sharon Gilbert's research about the veneration of the fallen ones. Uh, so that's the Nephilim, once again. I pondered a connection between the ancient ritual and Jesus' message about being living water. The dots connected in a way they haven't for me until today. I wanted to see if you would comment and expound on this concept in contrast that Jesus seems to be pointing to. I feel that he was speaking to this in contrast and God often does in scripture, pointing to the pagan world around them and directing us to his truth through that. You have such an amazing heart and mind. Well, thank you once again, Laura. Really appreciate, Jessica, sorry. Sorry about that. We appreciate you very much. Uh, may the Father God bless you and keep you and your family who are loved and thank you. Once again, Jessica, thank you so much for the kind words. Um, the occult and the dark side, Hell's Kitchen, as the late Russ Dizdar would say, would always, 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 they corrupt things. They give you part of the truth, but not all of the truth. And so there, there's always this counterfeit thing going on in the occult world, in the dragon's kingdom. So when Jesus tells us that he gives us living water, could it be a reference to that? Of course it could. But he is living water. He is the way, the truth, and the life. There's no doubt about that. And no one comes to the Father but by him. That sounds incredibly dogmatic, L.A. Yeah, it's good to be dogmatic about some things. There's only one that ever rose from the dead, other than Lazarus and some of the others that Jesus healed. But during that time, there's only one who was crucified that fulfilled how many scriptures? Like it's over 21 biblical prophetic texts in that 24-hour period where he's, his, his clothes are divided, not a bone in his body is broken. They pierce his side. They cast lots for his clothing. I mean, it's just, it goes on and on and on. That's all prophetic language found in our guidebook of the supernatural, i.e. our Bibles. It's right there. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Think about that. That's what he says is he's hanging there, separated from the Father. It is finished. And at that moment, the dragon loses everything. And that's why in my book, the, in the Cosmic Chess Match and Encounter Move, we talk about Bollinger's paper. Jesus descends to the lowest parts of hell, the lowest parts of the earth, Tartarus. And there he proclaims to the fallen angelic hosts who are locked up in these gloomy dungeons, no jailbreak, checkmate. I've got the keys right here. You're not getting out. More about that. If you're interested, check out the book, Counter Move, How the Nephilim Returned After the Flood. A lot of questions on the Nephilim today. That was not cherry-picked by me, so something's going on. People want to know. Anyway, I will be down in Texas this week, next weekend. Hope to see you there. Go to our website, Ellie Marzulli. You should have links, and, and check it out. You can sign up for it. Um, following that, we will be at the Prophecy Watchers Conference in Orlando. You'll definitely want to check that. Again, go to the website. If, you, if you've never been to Israel... Consider coming to us with Israel, okay? To Israel, sorry. Consider coming with us to Israel. Uh, it's a Nephilim tour. There's no other tour like it that I'm aware of. We go to Mount Hermon, and there on Mount Hermon, I sit there and lecture about the 200 watcher angels that came in the days of Jared, descended on Mount Hermon, and created what we know was an oath by their leader, Semyazi. I fear you will indeed not to do this thing, and I alone will bear the penalty of this great sin. That sets up the whole Genesis 6 deal. And they took wives from amongst them and had children by them. And the result of that, of course, the move, counter move that we see, the fallen angels come down, they meet with a woman, that's a move. The counter move is God goes, not so fast. And only eight people get on board the ark. And Noah was pure in all his generations. What does that mean? M.R. DeHaan says it wasn't sinless, but his DNA was not corrupt. Doug Hamp writes about corrupting a seed. Gary Stearman talks about, and the springboard to all this is Genesis 3.15. If we don't understand what Genesis 3.15 is, 
we'll never get there. Anyway, folks, I'll be in Orlando, prophecywatchers.com. Please consider signing up for that. Also consider our Nephilim tour going back to Israel once again, Mount Hermon, um, underneath the Temple Mount, those huge blocks of stone. Did the Romans carve them or did they just find them there and then hoist them up into the wall to show, hey, look what we found. Look how mighty we are. Tel Gezer, ancient Canaanite city and Nephilim architecture, in my opinion. Anyway, that's all the time I have for If you've got questions, please shoot us an email, questions at lamarzuli.net, questions at lamarzuli.net. We'll see you tomorrow with another supernatural confrontation. Thanks so much for watching. God bless all of you. We'll see you soon. Something very dark and disturbing is happening. It is a global phenomenon that knows no boundaries. It adheres to no cultural mores. And the ones who are engaged in this nefarious activity do so with impunity. People are being taken against their will. In the cover of darkness in the dead of night, they are subjected to bizarre examinations that are often sexual in nature. These people are terrified, violated, confused, and with no place to turn to, as who would believe them? This is their story.